happy Saturday. Recently, listener Greta wrote in and included a suggestion for an episode on the Peshtigo Fire. Prior hosts of the show covered the Peshtigo Fire as part of an episode on some of history's most unforgettable fires and some of the commonalities among those fires. In addition to the Peshtigo Fire, there's also the Great Fire of London, the Great Fire of Mariki, and the Great San Francisco Earthquake and Fire. While talking about the Mariki Fire, Sarah and Dublina mentioned the Great Kanto Earthquake of 1923, which we covered on the show on June 2nd, 2014. And on November 13th of 2019, we also took a longer look at the San Francisco Earthquake and Fire that's covered briefly in this episode. Thanks so much to Greta for inspiring today's Saturday Classic, and everyone enjoy. Welcome to Stuff You Missed in History Class, a production of iHeartRadio. Hello and welcome to the podcast. I'm Dublina Chakraborty. And I'm Sarah Dowdy. And we recently covered the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory Fire, which at the time was one of the deadliest workplace disasters New York and perhaps the entire country had ever seen. It was a tough one. It was tough to research and tough to talk about. It was tough to research because it was such a sad topic. But it is easy to see why listeners request it so much because it was fascinating to learn about. We were really fascinated by all the little vignettes from survivors, rescuers, witnesses. Some of the points that really struck us the most were how quickly the fire started and spread, how split-second decisions people made seemed to make a difference, and how it really influenced the lives of the people who were involved and legislation for years to come. So because of that episode, we decided we wanted to take a look at some other famous fires and just look at some of the parallels between them, look at some of those little split-second decisions and how that might be uh, the same in one fire that takes place in the 1600s and then one take one that takes place in the 1800s, and then just see how they're different, too. Exactly. And we're also going to take a look at the pre-fire environment, some parallels there. I mean, we saw in the Triangle Factory how it was really set up for disaster in a lot of ways with the cotton scraps lying around and the really crowded environment and people just generally ignoring signs of danger that were there to begin with. So the first fire on our list that we're going to take a look at is the Great Fire of London, a very famous one. And like the Triangle Factory Fire, the situation here was really just ripe for disaster. Fires weren't unusual in London in the first place in the 1600s, since timber construction and narrow streets were really the norm at the time. So by September of 1666, a long hot summer had made matters even worse. It was it dried out both the city and its water reserves. And according to the BBC, Some people had actually seen this coming. Some people had warned of the possibility of a major fire in London even before it got to this point. But most citizens at the time had something else on their minds. Right, Sarah? Plague. Yes. Plague at that time had killed about 68,000 people in the years leading up to 1666. So they were worried about other things. Understandable that that would be your top concern at the time. So when the Great Fire did start on September 2nd, 1666, it started in Pudding Lane near London Bridge, and it was in the home of the King's Baker, Thomas Farinor. And a workman had smelled smoke around two in the morning and told the Baker's family, and they had all managed to escape by fleeing over the roofs. And their maid was too scared to leave. And so she became the first casualty in this fire, even though you're going to probably be surprised to learn that very few people died in this fire, considering how disastrous it was. She was too scared to get out of the house, though. Yes, the house was quickly engulfed in flames. And from there, the fire spread through the narrow streets of London. But the mayor, Sir Thomas Bloodworth, for some reason, really wasn't that concerned at first. He was woken up about an hour after it started. And after being awoken, he said, a woman might piss it out of the fire. That was the descriptor. This colorful yeah. statement he makes. So it kept spreading from there, and London Bridge was burning by dawn. So just to give you a little understanding of how they fought fires in this time, or one of the ways they fought fires, they would build fire breaks or create fire breaks by destroying buildings in a fire's path so that it didn't have anything to spread to. It would just be brought to a sudden halt. And the strategy had been used in a fire in 1632 on London Bridge, and it created this open 
open space that ended up saving the bridge in 1666 so that the fire was confined to one part of the city. It couldn't jump the river. But it continued to just get worse and worse on the westward side of the city. And it was fanned by the wind. And the mayor kept on hesitating, though, about the fire break. So even though they were tested, it seemed to work, he wasn't willing to order a bunch of buildings blown up. Yeah, and I think what that came down to was just the cost of it. It was going to cost so much to rebuild those buildings, and that's why he was so hesitant about it. But King Charles II felt a little differently. He did want those fire breaks, but by the time that he ordered the mayor to destroy as many buildings as possible to make that happen, the fire was already too out of control for that strategy to really work. They would destroy houses too late, or the wind would just help the fire jump over the gap that they made. Yeah, and if you destroy the houses too late, you're just creating tinder, essentially. Yeah, because it was all wood. Right, if they didn't have time to clear it out before the fire got to it, they were actually kind of helping it along. So the fire raged on for three days. By Wednesday, it finally started to die down, and then by Thursday, it was extinguished. Flames did spring up again briefly at Temple Church, but the Duke of York made kind of a quick split-second decision there to blow up several buildings at once with gunpowder and create a fire fire break right away. So they were able to squelch that. So the fire was out by that point, but the damage to London was really significant. A large part of the city had been destroyed, including a lot of the civic buildings, old St. Paul's Cathedral. I think we mentioned that in an earlier episode on St. Paul's that one of many times it burned down. 87 parish churches had burned and about 13,200 houses. And according to the BBC, though, only four official deaths were reported. But some people think think that the actual death toll might have been a lot higher than that. Yeah, but regardless of the number of people that died, it affected thousands of citizens, somewhere around one-sixth of London's population, and they had to flee to places like Hampstead and Highgate and Moorfields, which was that last one was the chief refuge, I think. And Within days, they started putting together plans to rebuild the city. And Christopher Wren, of all people, got involved with this rebuilding plan and and presented plans to sort of remake the city, regularize the streets. And um, even though they stuck to old lines in most cases, they didn't just change the map of the city entirely. They broadened a lot of the streets and built houses out of brick instead of these sort of rough and tumble wooden houses that caught fire so easily. Yeah, but it it didn't stop there. Like the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory incident, everyone was looking for someone to blame after this. It wasn't just a simple rebuilding. They they wanted somebody to take the blame. So a parliamentary committee investigated the incident, but they couldn't find that it was anything other than a, quote, act of God. Even though a French watchmaker confessed to the crime and was executed for it, nobody really believed he did it. So people were still kind of always coming up with theories of what could have happened, especially since this was a time of political and religious upheaval. People pointed a finger at foreigners a lot and to Catholics for years. In fact, a monument that commemorated the fire bore an inscription blaming, quote, the treachery and the malice of the popish faction until 1831. When we can presume somebody sort of chiseled it off discreetly or something. But uh, it, it seems a little strange that there would even be a blame game if the fire starts in a bakery. I mean, it seems like a place where a fire accident could easily happen. Yeah, I agree. And I think most people accept that it was probably just the result of carelessness on the part of the baker or his maid, someone in the household. And we can rely on that at this point. All right, so our next fire might also be the result of carelessness, but no one's entirely sure. It is a fire that happened in Japan in 1657, the Meireki Fire, or the Great Fire of Meireki. And Japan's, of course, been in the news a lot lately, and a lot of people have probably heard of the Great Kanto Earthquake of 1923. And it was a noon earthquake, which meant lots of cooking fires were going, and so a big fire started across Tokyo and killed an estimated one 100,000 people. But before Tokyo was even Tokyo, back when it was still Edo, this fire took place. And it was the center of power for the Tokugawa shogunate. And the fire was just as deadly. Way back in 1657, 100,000 people were killed. 
Yeah, and considering how many people were killed in that fire, it might be especially surprising to learn that Edo had actually been a little fishing village just a few generations earlier. In the late 16th century, the shogun Tokugawa Ieyasu had moved Japan's capital to Edo and started a series of developments there. And over the years, the city just got bigger and bigger. Mountains were cut down to fill in the bay. Edo Castle was rebuilt, and by 1637, the city was operating under something called alternate attendance. Yeah, the alternate attendance system. And if you're trying to to think of what this is, it's kind of like a proto-Versailles almost. All the daimyo or lords had to live in the capital part-time. And when they weren't there, when they were back in their own estates, they had to leave some of their family behind as collateral, sort of like don't get up to any trouble off in your own estates because we have all you care about here. So there was this burgeoning elite living in Edo and, and buying lots of things and in need of lots of services. So that meant a lot of regular folks were moving to town to provide those services, merchants and entertainers and the like. So because of all the crowding, the narrow streets and alleys set up in this Kyoto grid style and, uh, of course, built and lined with houses made of wood and paper were sort of at risk for fires. And fires consequently did happen a lot. Yeah, similar to the situation in London that we just discussed. But in Japan, they even called these little fires the flowers of Edo. Yeah, just blooming across the city from time to time. But the fire that hit in 1657 was the worst, and it started in a temple. Legend has monks burning an unlucky long sleeve kimono. Um, you'll see different accounts. Sometimes the kimono belonged to several young girls who died before they could wear it. Sometimes there were a couple kimonos, each having belonged belong to a girl who died. But anyway, this gives us the fire's other name, which was the Furisode fire or Long Sleeves fire. You might hear it referred to that way. So strong winds from there carried the fire across moats and canals, and then the wind shifted and the fire burned the shops along the Sumida River. Supposedly, an unattended cooking fire in a samurai household helped feed it further, too, so it just kind of grew. 60% of the city was destroyed, and most of Edo Castle was destroyed. Yeah, and again, like London, the whole thing made the feudal government really reconsider how they were going to rebuild and whether there were improvements that could be made before you set up a similar situation again. And especially because by 1693, so just a few decades after this fire, the population was larger than that of London or Paris. So you had a lot of buildings to consider. This time, they mapped out the city and spread the buildings out more. There were still, of course, later fires. They didn't totally eliminate that threat. But according to a book called An Introduction to Japanese Architecture, this was a fairly successful attempt, early attempt, at city planning and a real turning point for the city. Yeah, and even laws that were made afterwards suggest fire consciousness. While commoners weren't allowed the extravagance of building a third floor on their homes, they were encouraged to use super expensive tile roofs and kura, or fireproof storehouses. So both of those things kind of became status symbols. Yeah, so you have sumptuary codes sort of just avoiding one avenue. If it, if it helps make the city more fire safe, go for it, even if, even if you look impressive doing it. Yeah. It became cool to be safe. Yeah. <laughs> so the first two fires we talked about are pretty well known, but the third fire on our list is one that got overshadowed a bit by another fire that occurred at the same time. And we're talking about the Peshtigo Fire, which occurred in 1871. It's sometimes called the Great Peshtigo Fire. It took place, obviously, in Peshtigo, Wisconsin. And it has the distinction of being the deadliest fire in U.S. history, but the reason it's not as well known as some other incidents is because it occurred on the same night as the Great Chicago Fire, October 8th, 1871. Some people think maybe even the same hour, right? Yeah, same hour, but a bit of a more mythical beginning, I guess, which is one reason that it might have overshadowed Peshtigo a little bit. We actually have a podcast on the legendary origins of the Great Chicago Fire. And a lot of people think it was started by Miss O'Leary's cow. So if you want to learn a little bit more about that and how true it is, you can um, go back and listen to that podcast. Part of the reason why it was overshadowed, though, is because Chicago is a bigger city and news is going to get out faster about a huge fire in Chicago that leaves a lot of people dead. Yeah, Peshtigo was a railroad and lumbering town, probably not as exciting as a big urban area like Chicago. 
There were about 800 men who were employed by a local woodware, woodenware factory sorry, and two sawmills, and the town had about 1,700 residents total. Once again, the conditions here were just right for a big fire. After harvesting trees, lumberjacks would leave piles of sawdust, brush, and limbs, known as slash, all over the forest floor. To add to this, men who cleared the land for railroads and farmers who needed to clear the land to plant in would torch trees, stumps, buildings, basically anything in their path. So small fires were burning around this area all the time, and no one really People thought anything were, of it. were cool with it, pretty much. But to make matters worse, there hadn't been that much rain during the summer and the early fall, so the area was especially dry. And by the first week of October, even the air in Peshtigo along the north shore of Green Bay was so thick with smoke from all of these little fires, from the farmers and the lumberjacks and all of that, that ships on Lake Michigan had to navigate by compass and harbor masters used fog horns to guide them ashore. So couldn't even see where you were going. Yeah, the environment, I guess, just really set the stage for something eerie to happen. But no one knows exactly what started the big fire October 8th. A recent article in History Magazine, I think in the March issue, actually discussed a couple of possibilities about that very thing. Lightning was apparently ruled out, but because of the conditions, some people speculate there may have been instances of spontaneous combustion on the forest floor. That always makes the story more interesting. Absolutely. Meteors? That's another That's another one that helps make things interesting. Meteor showers are actually pretty common in the upper Great Lakes region in the fall. So it's possible that chunks of a meteor could have landed in the Wisconsin woods and set all that tinder on fire. Yeah, and then strong winds that night would have added to the situation, fanning fires, causing them to combine and spread. So Wind is a major character in all of these fires that we're talking about. And chances are, even if it wasn't meteors, even if it wasn't spontaneous combustion, just all these little fires that had been set throughout the area, once the wind came through, it kind of combined and helped them spread all over the place. But regardless of what caused the fire, around nine that night, there was an eerie roaring sound. And then the fire just seemed to kind of fall out of the sky. Yeah. And and the wind really fed the flames, kept on feeding them. So it seemed like the air itself was on fire. People tried to outrun it, but they couldn't, and some were burned in the streets. And the really strange thing here is it would seem like they were far away from anything that was combustible. They weren't standing near the burning building or the burning tree or something like that. They just would suddenly ignite. Yeah. I mean, it's like the witnesses said, the fire was almost in the air, and that's what's so scary about this one. Some sought refuge lying flat in clearings or in the water of rivers or in Green Bay. So they would actually get in the river and kind of hold their breath and only come up for air to try to avoid catching on fire. Other people hid in cellars, which wasn't a good idea because they suffocated. Some people hid in wells and in ponds as well. So the flames just kept on spreading. They traveled over marshland, and you might think that that would put it out because there's lots of water in marshy areas, but instead it would just ignite rising gases. And from there, the flames were able to cross the Peshtigo River and jump the waters of Green Bay and Lake Michigan. So from there, the fire spread into other Wisconsin communities, including the Door and Kiwanti counties. It also spread into Michigan. It destroyed at least 17 communities total, and Peshtigo itself was obliterated in just an hour. And we saw that in, I think, the Triangle Factory fire, too, how quickly things seemed to happen. Yeah. Yeah. So the fire just kept on basically until it had nothing left to burn. I think, again, the winds have so much power. The winds changed and kind of turned the fire back on itself. But by that time, it had already killed somewhere between 1,200 and 2,500 people, 800 in Peshtigo alone, and destroyed about 1.3 million acres of forest land. So that's an area about twice the size of Rhode Island. And by contrast, 300 people were killed in the Chicago fire. So weigh those numbers together. But by the time the word of all of this reached Madison, it took two days to do so. The governor and the state representatives had all gone to help out with the Chicago crisis because, of course, that news had broken long before and everybody knew about it. And consequently, the Peshtigo fire didn't really get as much notoriety as Chicago, but it did lead to some new forest management programs and lumber harvesting techniques. Again, a few sort of social reforms or fire safety reforms coming out of a big disaster. (laughs) 
The last fire on our list is one that listeners will probably be most familiar with, at least from a visual standpoint, because it's the most recent one, and that's the Great San Francisco Earthquake and Fire. And to talk about this one, we've, of course, got to talk about the earthquake a little bit, I think. Definitely. So at 5.12 a.m. on April 18th, 1906, a foreshock shook the people of San Francisco awake in their beds. And about 20 seconds later, the shaking started again, except it was a lot harder this time, and it drove people out into the streets if they could get out of their houses. It lasted for nearly a minute, which seems like such a long time to be just waiting for your house to fall down or not around you. The famous tenor Enrico Caruso, for example, was in town. He had just performed a big show the night before, and he described it like being on a boat at sea, if you can imagine how shaky that is. I'm sure some of you have probably been in earthquakes, so you can not imagine it. But while the 7.9 magnitude earthquake could be felt as far away as central Nevada and southern Los Angeles, it was San Francisco that really got hit the hardest. Yeah, buildings collapsed. Weak masonry on the sides of homes kind of flopped off in sheets into the street, exposing dollhouse-like apartments. Chimneys fell in on otherwise sturdy wooden houses. Structures and formerly marshy areas were just swallowed up in sinkholes. Yeah, there's a famous four-story hotel that was swallowed up to the fourth floor and It just looks collapsed like a slinky sitting next to other buildings that are still their full height. Um, And probably most importantly for our story, gas lines broke. But within half an hour, the city's fire department had been – they'd responded to 52 fire alarms. And they seemed to be keeping pace. They seemed to be putting out these little fires, keeping things under control. But the fires just grew and they merged and they spread by dry wind from two main origin points. And one was the south of Market neighborhood and the other was north of Market Street near the waterfront. But because the water mains had been broken during the earthquake, the department didn't have that much to work with. They could put out these tiny fires, but when they were faced with these these growing walls of flame, there wasn't much they could do about it. Yeah, I think they only had 850,000 gallons of water to use. So the alternate options they had were what they had to turn to, but those weren't really great. One of the alternate options was that they could tap old cisterns. Now, those didn't have much water, so that was why that wasn't a great option. And the second option that they had was to have Navy ships pump water in from the bay, and that was kind of slow. So Yeah, both these were slow, and they didn't really get them that much water. Water either. So to make matters worse, Fire Chief Dennis Sullivan had been mortally wounded during the earthquake. He had had a master plan for a fire in San Francisco, and his replacement didn't. Yeah, so they didn't have some sort of operating idea of what to do. And things got more and more desperate. And the department's next move after tapping the cisterns and pumping in the water was to use dynamite to create fire breaks. And we've learned the danger of fire breaks already in this episode. But This is kind of an even worse situation. The Army base sent the wrong kind of explosive, flammable black gunpowder, and the explosives really just made things worse. So exploding buildings would shoot off debris everywhere, which would ignite at ruptured gas lines. And then the other thing that would happen is sturdy walls that really might have helped actually serve as fire breaks were destroyed and brought to to the ground in rubble. So later that day, other blazes joined the wall of the main fire. They were judged at one point to be nearly 20 floors high and 2,000 degrees. One started in Hayes Valley from a damaged chimney, and another one started at the restaurant Delmonico's from a soldier's campfire. And at that point, the mayor ordered martial law. Yeah, and you can can look at the order— the proclamation. And it came out not long after after the earthquake. So of course, people are still totally in a state of shock. And there's some practical advice, like don't use your damaged chimney. But way at the top, it says, we'll shoot to kill all looters. And I think people were a little disturbed by that. And it was something that got a lot of criticism after the fact. But by Friday night, the fires finally started to die down, and it was over by Saturday. But by that point, 4.7 square miles of San Francisco had been burned, 508 city blocks. And 
With so much destruction, you would think that maybe the large death toll, 3,000 to 5,000 people, were the result of the fire as well as the earthquake. But most of the deaths did occur during the earthquake because there's not much you can do when, when something strikes and you're at home in bed. Whereas the fire, people could see it coming and they had time to grab what they could and, and get out, whether by ferry or, or just going to other parts of the city. Yeah, some people had to relocate multiple times. Chinese refugees, for example, who stayed in the city were forced to relocate over and over. Yeah, so they faced some persecution there, although not the ones who had fled to Oakland, interestingly. But um, just if there's so much out there on this fire, if you want to learn a little bit more about it or look at pictures. You mentioned uh, when we first started talking about it that it's a very visual earthquake and fire. There's a great Smithsonian story with color photos, actually. It was a year before color photography was commercially available. It's kind of strange to look at at color pictures from 1906. There's another interesting Smithsonian story about the men who stayed behind to defend the San Francisco Mint and protect $300 million that was kept inside, which is the equivalent of $6 billion today and had would have had a pretty tremendous effect on the economy potentially if that had all been lost. But they stayed right in the path of the fire and used well water, I think, to defend the building. And it withstood the fire and became sort of a, a memorial to the fire for the city of San Francisco because it was one of the few buildings that had survived. And today it's even in the process of becoming the museum of the city of San Francisco. So you can potentially go visit this hallowed site of the fire at some point. And you can check out their website now, too. That's where I found the Caruso quote. They have all sorts of survivors' accounts. Thanks so much for joining us on this Saturday. Since this episode is out of the archive, if you heard an email address or a Facebook URL or something similar over the course of the show, that could be obsolete now. Our current email address is historypodcast at iheartradio.com. Our old How Stuff Works email address no longer works. You can find us all over social media at Missed in History. And you can subscribe to our show on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, the iHeartRadio app, and wherever else you listen to podcasts. Stuff You Missed in History Class is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows. 